During the First World War, Britain's railways came under government control. After that conflict, nationalisation was proposed, but proved to be unachievable. So instead, the Railways Act of 1921 was passed, which grouped the railways in 1923 into four large companies. The Great Western, the Southern, the London Midland and Scottish, and the London and North Eastern. In this series, we'll take a look at each of these companies, their engineers, policies and innovations that they brought, as well as what remains of them in the preservation era. This is the Big Four at 100. The Southern was the smallest of the Big Four, with 2,200 miles of track. Its three main constituents were the London and South Western, the London, Brighton and South Coast, and the South Eastern and Chatham, supplemented by 14 subsidiaries. In the home counties, the subsidiaries included the London and Greenwich and the Mid Kent. Further west was the North Cornwall, the Plymouth, Devonport and South Western, and the Sidmouth. The Southern had a virtual monopoly in South London and Hampshire, building up a considerable suburban network. It also controlled the channel ports at Dover, Folkestone and Southampton. Upon its formation, the company divided itself into three sections, Eastern, Central and Western, which followed the pattern set by the main constituents. Timetables continued in the same manner, but there were problems at the top, with three general managers. Eventually, the role was given to Herbert Walker from the LSWR. The LSWR was the largest constituent and worked the western section. From Waterloo, it ran to Hampshire, serving Portsmouth and Southampton, but further west, its main line continued to Plymouth, and the company also had a share in the Somerset and Dorset. Waterloo was opened in 1848 and gradually expanded with a new southern station added in 1878. The north side was enlarged in 1885, leading to a very complex layout. In the end, the station was completely rebuilt between 1900 and 1922. One complication was that suburban trains had to cross the main lines, the solution being a flyover at Wimbledon. The track layout and signalling were also altered and a new power box installed with 309 levers controlling the section from Waterloo to Nine Elms. Its main workshop was at Eastleigh, opened in 1909 on a 41-acre site. This replaced the previous works at Nine Elms and would become the sole workshop on the western section. The LSWR's principal main line from Waterloo was to Exeter via Basingstoke and Salisbury. Opened in stages, it rivalled the GWR's Barks and Hans line via Westbury and Taunton. Coming off the main line were a series of branches, with some again rivalling the Great Western. This was particularly notable west of Exeter, which spurred off the Withered Arm to Plymouth via Oakhampton. Other branches served the coastal towns of Sidmouth, Lyme Regis and Seaton. The central section belonged to the London, Brighton and South Coast. Its main line was completed in 1841, serving the commuter network from Victoria and London Bridge. At the other end, the coastway route ran from Hastings to Southampton via Brighton. Brighton Works opened in 1852, on a cramped nine-acre site next to the station. Expanded by Stroudley in 1873, a carriage works was erected at Lansing in 1888. Secondary routes were of a cross-country nature, reaching Guildford, Tunbridge and St Leonard's, whilst the port was completed at New Haven in 1867. The final constituent, the South Eastern and Chatham, made up the eastern section. It was formed in 1899, after a merger between the South Eastern and the London, Chatham and Dover. The South Eastern was the oldest, dating from 1836, and ran across Kent from its London termini at Charing Cross and Cannon Street. The LCDR, meanwhile, dated from 1853, running from Dover Harbour to Victoria, which it shared with the LBSCR. After the formation, the stock was in a poor condition, mainly coming from contractors or second-hand. A massive series of improvements were made to the rolling stock and infrastructure, 
and by 1923 the company also owned 13 ferries running from Dover and Folkestone. The SECR's workshops were at Ashford, opened in 1847 on a 26-acre site. This was followed by a 32-acre wagon works opened in 1850. Three of the subsidiaries came from the Isle of Wight, the freshwater Yarmouth and Newport, the Isle of Wight Central and the Isle of Wight, which had all helped develop a network of lines across the island. The first section, from Cowes to Newport, was completed in 1862, followed by Ride to Shanklin in 1864, being extended to Ventnor in 1866. All these lines became the Isle of Wight Railway in 1875. The famous Ride Pier opened in 1880 as a joint venture between the LSWR and the LBSCR. The next railway to appear was the Isle of Wight Central in 1887, following a merger of three smaller companies. The freshwater Yarmouth and Newport, meanwhile, was completed in 1889, being taken over by the Central in 1913. The Isle of Wight and Central Railways utilised Bay Peacock 240 tanks, with 19 in total, whilst the FY and NR used X Brighton Terriers. In 1923, however, the Southern transferred two XLSWR O2s. Twelve had arrived by 1928 to replace worn-out stock. All carried the names of towns and villages, a tradition started by the Isle of Wight Eastern in 1864. Fitted with extended bunkers, 21 were based on the island by 1948. The coaching stock was also second-hand, coming from either the Brighton or the SECR. All had air brakes, as the island network used the Westinghouse braking system. Some retained the original panelling, whilst the SECR stock had modified brake ends due to height restrictions. One curiosity of the Southern was the Linton and Barnstable in Devon. Opened in 1898, it ran for 19 and a half miles and was constructed to a high standard as the Act of Parliament predated the Light Railways Act of 1896. This included the installation of mainline signalling and a viaduct at Cheltham. It was worked by a fleet of Manning Wardle 262 tanks and all carried the names of three letter rivers. Later joined by a Baldwin locomotive, the railway spent 13 years under Southern ownership, closing in 1935. The company's first CME was Richard Maunsell. Born in Ireland in 1868, he joined the Great Southern and Western in 1886, later moving to Horridge and India. Returning to Britain, he replaced Harry Wainwright on the SECR in 1898. Two of his first appointments were Harry Hallcroft from the Great Western and James Clayton from the Midland. All three set about producing a new range of locomotives to replace the pre-grouping classes and oversaw the Southern's electrification programme. Maunsell also set about standardising the coaching stock based on a new loading gauge. Carriage classification ran from 0 to 4, with 0 being the widest. This resulted in the Southern having the widest range of standard stock. The new stock was inspired by the LSWR and featured first and third class accommodation with a corridor connection. Each compartment though had its own door for ease of access and the same principle was applied to EMU stock. When Maunsell took over he inherited a fleet of 2,285 locomotives from 125 classes. One of these were the Uri N15s of the LSWR from 1918, who received drafting improvements using the exhaust from the similar H15s. The class became known as the King Arthurs, after a name suggestion from the publicity assistant John Elliott. He realised that the company served the counties with an Arthurian link, mainly Hampshire and Cornwall, but Maunsell was not impressed. The first were rebuilt from the Uri engines, but an increase in demand and a revised timetable meant that they couldn't cope. So, 30 were ordered from the North British Locomotive Company in Glasgow, 
nicknamed Scotch Arthurs, whilst another 14 came from Eastleigh. On the mixed traffic front, Maunsell produced two moguls. The first class, the ENs, dated back to 1915, with the prototype appearing in 1917, although the first batch wasn't finished until 1923. To start with, they suffered from rough riding and poor steaming, the solutions being to rebalance the wheels and copy the exhaust from the Churchwood 4300s. After the First World War, the ENs were selected for a government programme to provide new work for armaments factories. Progress was slow, with 100 being stored or part-built by 1923. 27 went to the Great Southern Railway in Ireland and 6 to the Metropolitan, being rebuilt as 264 tanks. The rest went to the Southern, where they gained the nickname Woolworths. Another 15 appeared in 1930, but the order wasn't completed until 1934. These all had steel frames and a modified blast pipe, and strangely, 8 had left-hand drive, when standard practice was for right-hand drive. The N was followed by the very similar U-class, the only difference being the U's had larger driving wheels. Their story begins with the derailment at Seven Oaks in 1927, with one of the River-class 264 tanks. These were found to be unstable at high speed, and after the accident, a rebuilding program was soon introduced. The first example appeared in 1928, with construction being carried out at all three of the Southern's workshops. The last batch appeared in 1931 with larger tenders, and the class underwent a number of trials, including pulverised coal in 1929 and oil firing in 1947. Used on secondary passenger and freight turns, one of the largest allocations was at Guildford. Others worked the cross-country route from Reading to Red Hill and around Brighton and Eastbourne, with some finding their way onto the West of England main line. A difficult route to conquer was that from Tonbridge to Hastings, which had very tight clearances. By the 1920s, Hastings was becoming popular with commuters and holiday makers, but the restrictions led to concerns about a new locomotive with adequate power. The solution appeared in 1930 with the schools class. These had a 440 wheel arrangement for the tight curves and a curved profile on the cab roof and tender. A three cylinder layout was adopted, although by the time the first 10 were underway, the track work was still being upgraded. Whilst work was ongoing, the class was split between Kent and Hampshire, where they handled Waterloo to Portsmouth Expresses. Their performance was so good that the Southern ordered 30 more, allocating them across the network, with those at Brighton working cross-country services to Cardiff as far as Salisbury. However, Maunsell didn't just focus on new locomotives. He also continued some production lines, most notably the H-15s and S-15s, and rebuilt some pre-grouping classes. One of these were the LSWR 700s with superheaters, whilst the Brighton Baltic tanks became class N-15X 460s. Despite ringing in the changes, the company was still losing revenue to trams and buses, whilst rural lines suffered dramatically after the Great Depression, with some losing half their passengers. So, the Southern expanded the electrification programme, started by the LSWR in 1915, which stretched from Waterloo to Wimbledon, Richmond and Shepparton. Backed by the chairman, Sir Herbert Walker, the programme was conducted by Alfred Roweth from the SECR. He chose a 660 volt DC third rail system, later increased to 750 volts, which was cheaper to construct and became standard from 1926. By 1930, electrification had reached Windsor, Guildford and Gravesend, making for 277 and a half miles of track. The Brighton Main Line followed in 1933, with all stations, track and signalling being upgraded. The new electric trains allowed an hourly service to be introduced and a new Pullman, which we'll see later. Eastbourne was reached in 1935, followed by Portsmouth in 1937 and Chichester 
in 1938, with the system proving to be very popular with commuters and holiday makers. The next stage was to Kent, with Seven Oaks and Maidstone being reached by 1939. However, further expansion was delayed by World War II, as was the extension to Bournemouth via Southampton. But the system proved to be so successful that the programme was continued by British Railways. At the start of our period, electric services accounted for 77 million journeys, with a weekly average of 130,000. By the start of the Second World War, the weekly average had increased to 170,000. The system also allowed new areas to be opened up and new housing estates built in a similar fashion to the Metropolitan's famous Metroland. Some stations were also rebuilt in a new Art Deco style, such as Surbiton in Surrey. Such was the rapid expansion of electrification that many pre-grouping classes were either withdrawn or displaced. The displacements found a new lease of life on secondary routes and branches which was unsuitable for the new stock. One of these was the LSWR M7s, with some fitted with push-pull gear. They made a name for themselves on branches to Seaton and Swanage, with others being used for ECS duties between Waterloo and Clapham. Another were the Brighton Terriers, some of which came from the Isle of Wight after the arrival of the O2s. They worked at New Haven Harbour and on Hailing Island, where the viaduct at Langston had a severe weight restriction. Two more, meanwhile, found a use as departmental shunters at Brighton and Lansing Works. Away from the more mundane services, the Southern was the largest user of Pullmans in the UK. Some Pullman trains already ran by the grouping, but the company did add more. The last to be added was the Devon Bell in 1947 from Waterloo to Plymouth and Ilfracombe, which split at Exeter. Some Pullmans ran in boat trains, particularly the Golden Arrow, introduced in 1929. It ran from Victoria to Calais via Dover, whilst the similar night ferry travelled from Brussels using a rail-borne ferry. Other cross-channel services reached Cherbourg and Le Havre from Folkestone. At Southampton, ocean liner trains worked in conjunction with Cunard White Star, offering a quick connection between train and ship. For these duties, Maunsell produced the Lord Nelsons in 1926. The design was planned in 1923, but Focus soon switched to the Arthurs. However, plans were soon in place for a locomotive capable of handling 500 tonnes with a four-cylinder layout. The Nelsons were a master stroke of design, combining a high power output with high tense steel to reduce weight. In reality though, there was very little work for them, with the initial order for 30 being reduced to 16. Their names meanwhile were another brainwave, as the Southern served the naval docks of Portsmouth and Plymouth. They required skillful handling, due to the large firebox being allocated to only four depots. Various experiments were trialled on the firebox, blast pipe and driving wheels, but it was the fitting of Lemaitre exhaust by Bullied in 1937 that really showed their potential. In 1931, the Southern introduced a new Pullman service, the Bournemouth Bell. Originally non-stop, a call at Southampton was later made and the train extended to Bournemouth West to meet the Somerset and Dorset. Taking around two hours, the train was a daily working in the summer. But the most famous Pullman service was the Brighton Bell, introduced in 1898 as the Limited Pullman and renamed the Southern Bell in 1908. Consisting of two hourly trains, the Bell had 12 coaches and was steam worked until 1932. In 1933, the Bell became the world's only all-electric Pullman train. Made up of three five-coach sets, it made three return trips, with the schedule reduced to 51 minutes in each direction. Only two units were in use at any one time, with the third kept as a spare. It soon became popular with artists from Brighton and other celebrities, and remained in service until 1972, the only break being during World War II. 
Despite all the passenger trains and electric units, the Southern did carry some freight. In 1892, the LSWR had acquired Southampton Docks, which was expanded in 1930, costing £8 million. It also had three marshalling yards at Feltham, Norwood and Hither Green, plus a terminal at Bricklayer's Arms. Cross London freights worked west from Clapham to Wealston and east from Croydon to Shoreditch. The bulk of this traffic was agricultural from the West Country with some coal from Kent. The latter accounted for 2 million tonnes per year, with 90% carried by rail. The four main collieries were at Bettishanger, Chislet, Snowdon and Tillmanston, and all four also served the local industries within the county. By the 1930s, some companies started using their own lorries, especially in rural areas, so the Southern built specialist wagons. The forerunner to the modern container, these allowed rail-to-road shipment to take place and expanded the door-to-door service available to customers. In 1937, Maunsell was replaced by Oliver Bullied. Born in New Zealand in 1882, Bullied had worked under Henry Ivert and later became works manager at Doncaster under Gresley in 1912. During his time on the LNER, Bullied had a hand in the design of the P2s and A4s. Something of an eccentric, Bullied produced steam and electric designs, including the Ford DD unit, the UK's only double-decker trains. He also produced the infamous Leader with its chain drive and enclosed a boiler. When war broke out in 1939, the Southern was right on the front line, being the closest company to continental Europe. The Army had camps at Aldershot, Salisbury Plain and Longmore, whilst the Navy was based at Portsmouth, Devonport and Portland. The company also played a key role in Dunkirk and D-Day, with freight traffic increasing by 60%. In 1940, 200 evacuation trains left London and 50 from the Medway area, moving 35,000 people. During the fall of France, the Dunkirk evacuation saw 620 train movements in eight days. In the build-up to D-Day, 24,459 trains ran between the 26th of March and the 6th of June, with 3,636 of them in the last week. After the landings, this continued, with 18,000 movements a day until July. Despite wartime constraints, Bullied produced the merchant navies, promoted as mixed traffic, when in reality they were express locomotives. Externally, they had air smooth casing, American box box wheels, and surprisingly, given the blackout, electric lighting. Internally, they featured a steel firebox and chain driven valve gear housed in an oil bath. The latter suffered from corrosion caused by water leakage leading to a characteristic slippage when starting. The firebox needed replacing after seven years, whilst the fuel and maintenance costs were exceedingly high. However, the boiler was an excellent steam raiser, whilst the trailing truck gave a smooth ride. Under BR, a rebuilding program was carried out from 1956 to 59, which saw the valve gear replaced and the oil bath and casing removed. A scaled-down version of the Merchant Navy was the Light Pacific, with 110 examples. This saw the Southern jump from no Pacifics in 1940 to 140 by 1951. The Light Pacifics came from Brighton and Eastleigh Works and consisted of two classes, the West Countries and Battle of Britons. The West Countries carried the names of towns and beauty spots being allocated to the western section. The Battle of Britons, meanwhile, worked on the central and eastern sections and named after personnel, aircraft and bases, with the last appearing in 1951. With so many Pacifics, the Maunsell classes soon found themselves displaced. But the Light Pacifics suffered the same problems as the Merchant Navies and were included in BR's rebuilding program. However, with the advent of electrification, only 60 were completed, unlike the Merchants, which had all members rebuilt. 
the massive increase in freight traffic illustrated how outdated the Southern's freight fleet was, as the company had focused on electrification before the war. Its most modern locomotives being the 45 S15s and the 20 Qs, with the rest made up of pre-grouping stock. Severe weight restrictions ruled out an eight-couple design, so Bullied worked on a locomotive designed down to the bare basics. The result was the Q1, with no running plate and Ida glass lagging, mounted on a frame whilst many of the components were fabricated. Weighing just 51 and a quarter tons, all the Q1s appeared in 1942. Allocated to the western and central sections, the class could be found working to Hither Green and Felton marshalling yards and cross London freights to other members of the Big Four. The war hit the Southern hard, with 170 staff lost whilst on duty, 12% of stations damaged and 10% of coaching stock destroyed. As a replacement, Bullied produced his own range of coaches, learning from his experience under Gresley. One of these was a tavern car based on an English pub. However, the small windows were disliked by passengers, whilst his full DD units suffered from overcrowding due to the cramped loading gauge. As early as 1946, 80% of traffic had returned to pre-war levels. New services, such as the Devon Bell Pullman mentioned earlier, appeared, and the company also produced three diesel locomotives, although these weren't outshopped until 1950. In preservation, all three of the Southern's constituents are represented, whilst Maunsell has a wide selection, from express passenger types, to the Sol Q class number 541 on the Bluebell. Another sole survivor is Q1 number C1, which is part of the National Collection. Also from the war are four USA shunters, 14 of which were acquired by the Southern for use at Southampton docks. The most numerous type are the Bullied Pacifics, with a combined total of 31 from all three classes, with both original and rebuilt light Pacifics, and many have returned to the main line. The LSWR has 12 locomotives, including T9 number 120 in the National Collection. Restored into its LSWR P Green livery, she worked rail tours from 1961 to 63 and has been based at the Mid Hants, Swanage, and Bodmin and Wentford. From Joseph Beatty are two of his well tanks which survived as part of a trio on the Wentford Bridge China Clay trains. These are number 30585 at Quainton Road and 30587 which again is part of the National Collection. Number 488 is a class 0415 radial tank designed by William Adams. Sold to the Ministry of Munitions in 1917, it was acquired by the East Kent in 1919 becoming their number 5. Working until 1943, she joined two others on the Lyme Regis branch, being ideal for the line's steep gradients and tight curves. Withdrawn in 1961 after arrival of Ivert 2MT tanks, number 488 was sold to the Bluebell and restored into her LSWR livery. Since then, she's had three working periods on the railway, but hasn't run since 1990. Also from Adams are two B4 dock shunters. Number 96 Normandy is on the Bluebell, having been purchased from Corals of Southampton in 1972. The second is number 102 Granville, saved by Billy Butlin and has been on display at Bressingham since 1971. The final LSWR survivor of note is M7 number 30053 who, between 1967 and 1986, was based at Steamtown at Scranton in Pennsylvania. Repatriated in 1987, the locomotive was restored at Swindon and Chapel in Essex, but has been based at Swanage since 1992. The LBSCR has three locomotives, including Gladstone, preserved by the Stevenson Locomotive Society in 1927, and currently on display at York. The E4, number 473 Birch Grove, is the only non-Stroudley example, being designed by Robert Billington. 
named after a hamlet near Horsted Keynes, she can naturally be found on the Bluebell. Arriving in 1962, Birchgrove underwent an extensive restoration between 1983 and 1997. But the most numerous Brighton locomotives are the Terriers, with 10 which have survived through various sources. Number 54 Wadden is at the Canadian Railway Museum in Montreal, box numbers 40 Brighton, 62 Martello and 78 Noel came from Butlins. Number 55 Stepney was the first locomotive to arrive on the Bluebell in 1960 and later inspired one of the Railway Series books by Wilbert Audrey in 1963. In the same year, Stepney was joined by number 72 Fenchurch, which was rebuilt into her A1 configuration in 2001. The Bluebell was the first standard gauge railway to reopen on an XBR route. Running initially from Sheffield Park to just south of Horsted Keynes, the line closed in 1955, but reopened after a clause in the Act of Parliament was discovered. It finally closed in 1958. Trains worked in top and tail formation until access to Horsted Keynes was granted in 1962. To start with, the railway focused on pre-grouping stock, including a former Metropolitan Chesham set of coaches. Supported by the Bluebell Railway Trust, the line is home to a number of groups, such as the Maunsell Locomotive Society and the Bullied Society. Rolling stock covers a wide range, from pre-grouping examples to BR Mark 1s and a superb rake of Pullmans. King's Coat was reached in 1994, but the next section to East Grinstead required the removal of rubbish from Imberhorn Cutting. Completed in 2013, the Bluebell has a current length of 11 miles. Future plans would see a further extension westwards from Horsted Keynes to Ardingley. The viaduct at Sheriff Mill was demolished, but the gap would be filled by spoil from Imberhorn. Once achieved, the railway will be unique in having two mainline connections at East Grinstead and Haywards Heath. The final constituent, the SECR, has eight locomotives across five classes. The singles are 01, number 65, H, number 263, and C, number 592, on the Bluebell, having previously been based at Ashford. D-Class, number 737 meanwhile, is on display at York. The largest class is also the smallest, in the form of four P-Class 060 tanks, making for 50% of the total production. Three are on the Bluebell, with number 323 arriving in 1960 and named Bluebell, followed by number 27 in 1961. Number 178 arrived in 1969 from Bow Waters at Sittingbourne, whilst the fourth member is number 753 on the Kenton East Sussex. The Kenton East Sussex ran from Robertsbridge to Headcorn. It was part of the Colonel Stevens Empire, the light railway specialist, and was opened in 1905. Independent until nationalisation, the Kesra closed to passengers in 1954, with freight lasting until 1961. Reopened in 1974, the railway gradually reopened in stages, reaching Bodium in 2000. As well as number 753, the Southern is represented by two Terriers, number 70 Poplar and 78 Noel, and two USA Shunters, numbers 30065 and 30070. Coaching stock features pre-grouping examples, with some from the London Chatham and Dover, one of the forerunners of the SECR. Over on the Isle of Wight, its Heritage Railway was founded by the White Locomotive Society. After acquiring O2, number W24 Calborn, and a fleet of coaches, the Society was based at Newport, but had to move to Haven Street in 1971. A five and a half mile railway now operates from Wharton to Smallbrook Junction, reached in 1991. The majority of the stock is related to the island, with a museum opening at Haven Street in 2014. Returning to the mainland, 13 locomotives are from the Maunsell era. One of these is the Sol N-Class, number 31874, 
alongside four of the U class. Two, numbers 31625 and 31806, have worked on the main line and are now at Swanage, with the latter being one of the river class rebuilds. The other two are numbers 31618 and 31638 on the Bluebell. In the National Collection is number 850 Lord Nelson, which spent many years at Carnforth but only saw occasional use. Later moved to Eastleigh, she received an overhaul between 1997 and 2006 and is currently on the Mid Hants. Also in the collection is number 30777 Salamuel, one of the Scotch Arthurs, who replaced number 30453 King Arthur, which was not in original condition. Loaned to the Humberside Locomotive Preservation Group, she was restored between 1978 and 1982. Becoming mainline registered, Sir Lamuel moved to the Great Central from Hull in 1995 in the care of the 5305 Locomotive Association. Withdrawn in 2017, an overhaul is currently underway. Similar in design are the five S15s, supplemented by two of their forebearers from Robert Urey. Number 847 on the Bluebell was the last built and the last 460 by the Southern. Number 828, meanwhile, is the only example to return to the main line, whilst three are based on the North Yorkshire Moors. One, number 841, arrived in 1978, having been restored at Chapel between 1972 and 74. Withdrawn in 1994, the frames were used in the restoration of number 825, with the third, number 30830, currently awaiting restoration having been purchased from the Bluebell. The school's class has three examples, and again, one, number 925, Cheltenham, is in the National Collection. The locomotive made a brief appearance at the Rocket 150 celebrations in 1980, but didn't receive a full restoration until 2012 at the Mint Hants. Number 928 Stowe was acquired by the Bewley Motor Museum, being displayed there with three Pullmans from 1964 to 73. Moved to the East Somerset, she's been based on the Bluebell since 1980, under the care of the Maunsell Locomotive Society. The final member is number 926 Repton, which, like the M7 seen earlier, was first preserved in the USA at Steamtown in Vermont. Fitted with a cowcatcher and high-sided tender, she was loaned to the Cape Breton Railway in Canada before being repatriated in 1989 and is now based on the North Yorkshire Moors. The bullied light Pacifics have 20 members with 10 still in original condition, split between four West Countries and six Battle of Britons. One West Country, number 34092 City of Wales, was fitted with a Geisel ejector in 1986, repeating a BR experiment carried out on number 30464 Fighter Command in 1962. The other ten are rebuilds, split between seven West Countries and three Battle of Britons. Only one of the Eastleigh Bats survives, number 34101 Heartland on the North Yorkshire Moors, whilst number 34027 Tor Valley was very active in the 1990s, helping to lift BR's steam ban on the Southern in 1993. Meanwhile, the larger merchant navies have 11 survivors, with 5 returning to traffic. The first of these was number 35027 Portline in 1988. One, number 35029 Airman Lines will never steam again, having been sectioned at the NRM, but a project is underway to restore number 35011 General Steam Navigation into original condition. The best known is number 35028 Clan Line, the last active member of the class in 1967. Purchased by the Merchant Navy Locomotive Preservation Society, she was first based at Longmore, later moving to Bulmers in Hereford via Ashford. Becoming one of the first locomotives to run after the steam ban was lifted, Clan Line worked over the Welsh marches from Carnforth the Harrogate Circuit and the Shakespeare Express to Stratford-upon-Avon. Relocated to South Hall in 1988, she found new work in the Midlands and North Wales. 
since 1999, Clanline has been a regular on the VSOE series of trains. Now based at Stewart's Lane, she received a major overhaul from 2001 to 6 and is now a familiar sight in southern England. One railway which has a strong connection with the Bullies is the Mid Hants, running for 10 miles from Alton to Alsford along the former LSWR route from Alton to Winchester. Known as Over the Alps, it was a secondary route and thus never electrified. Closed in 1973 and reopened in 1977, the railway returned to Alton in 1985. This gave the Mid Hants a mainline connection and has also established a workshop at Ropley. Over the years, all three classes of Bullied have been based here and the railway is currently home to both versions of Light Pacific. Other southern classes are 2 Uri and 1 Maunsell S15, as well as Lord Nelson and Cheltenham seen earlier. Another railway with bullied links is the Swanage. Closed in 1972, track lifting was immediate, with Swanage Station sold to the council. Access was granted in 1974, with Hurston Holt being reached in 1984, followed by Harmon's Cross in 1988. The next stage was to Corfe Castle, achieved in 1993. The track bed had been earmarked for a bypass, but upon reaching Norden, the railway established a park and ride system. In 2007, a connection was made at Fursbrook, and ten years later, trials took place with trains running from Swanage to Wareham, which the railway hopes to make a regular feature of its operations. The Swanage is home to Southern Locomotives Limited, who have a large fleet of bullies and its own workshop at Hurston. Other Southern stock include M7, number 30053, seen earlier, T3, number 563, and 3, Maunsell Moguls. We conclude this programme with Salamuel departing with a rail tour from Hastings, and be sure to look out for other episodes in this series.